Law at Work is sponsored by Perit van Niekerk, Widows Macholo, leading labour law specialists representing businesses throughout South and Southern Africa, as well as Case Law, the quick, fast and easy labour law search engine. Hello, I'm Simon Coleman and welcome to The Law at Work. A number of labour cases have been covered by the media lately, where dismissed employees have claimed to have made a protected disclosure and are therefore protected from disciplinary procedures. This week we'll be exploring the issue with the help of Andre Fanikak of Perit Fanikak Woodhouse Macholo and Wayne Smerden of De Beers. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Thanks Simon. Uh, the first question directed at you, Andre. Um, the Act seems to be there to protect the whistleblower. Um, could you just briefly outline how this affects the labour environment? Um, some of the Protected Disclosures Act was enacted in 2002. What it uh, seeks primarily to do is to protect employees who make disclosures about criminal and other wrongdoing um, against what are called occupational detriments or acts of victimisation or other forms of reprisal uh, by their employers. Um, I think it's important to see uh, the protection that the Act grants against the background of, firstly, the employment relationship itself. Um, at common law, uh, an employee is obliged to further the interests of the employer uh, at all times. And where so wrong could almost be at odds then with, with what Exactly. The, uh, the employee finds him or herself in a dilemma situation yes. where some wrongdoing uh, is observed. Do, right. do, you, do you comply with your obligations to further the employer's interest by keeping quiet? Yes. Or do you further the public good by mm. reporting the wrongdoing to the necessary authorities? And, and the, the Act resolves that dilemma for the employee okay. by providing uh, a mechanism through which the employee uh, can make uh, a disclosure and by providing the necessary protection against reprisal or victimisation for having made it. Yes, so, so since 2002, I mean, have employers actually done anything to, to put procedures in place to handle these things? Uh, Wayne, uh, from your perspective. I think uh, largely, yes, Simon. Uh, the, the issue, though, is that, that it, it needs to be aligned with, with probably your existing processes. It needs to be aligned with, with the the governance structures that you have within your organization. Uh, the, the, the fundamental issue really is about, is about people having that, that the, the faith in, in the process and the procedure, all good and well putting the, the procedure into place. And people see, see the employer being too close to it. Yes. To, so there, there, there are a number of ways of doing this, putting the policy into, into place, aligning it with your, your values, aligning it with your governance through internal audit, Yes. Uh, and then, and then communicating it to employees that, that, that there's a sense of, of, of understanding that there is this protection. So, uh, would it be handled, say, like other grievances? Because I was looking at the legislation earlier, and, and there seemed to be some mention of discriminatory practices, for instance, also falling under the auspices of that. Is, is that the case? Not, not necessarily. I think, I think you, you, the, the procedure has to be quite, quite stringent and rigid in terms of, of, of uh, it. It having to, 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 to be prescriptive around what the conditions are upon which the disclosure will be mm, protected, mm. Uh, issues around the reasonable truth of, of the, certainly the, 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 the employee understanding oh. uh, that, that there's, the, there's, there's an element of truth yes, in it. Yes, that, 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 that's a key. Sorry, sorry, Andre, can I just ask mm. you to comment on that? Because, I mean, employers obviously may have these kind of things raised all the time. Yeah. You know, do they have to take them all seriously yeah. or...? Yeah. Well, so Simon, what, what, um, what the employee must do uh, in order for, uh, to be protected under the statute uh, is firstly make a disclosure, in yes. other words, submit information that tends to indicate that uh, some criminal or other wrongdoing um, has, has, has occurred. That disclosure must be made in good faith. It's not necessary that the employee actually believes that the information is true or that the truth of the information uh, is, is proved uh, either at the time or after it. Um, and in this sense, there's another important balance that the Act seeks to strike. It, it's, it, it's, it's one that relates to the freedom of expression uh, in, in the workplace. So the Act would encourage employees to make disclosures. Um, the reason for setting up uh, the procedural requirements that Wayne has referred to is to protect reputational interests in the business. So if it transpires at the end of the day that the information is in fact not true, 
um, by having dealt with uh, an investigation internally and by having verified uh, the information internally, uh, the reputation of the company itself and its managers uh, is not tarnished. Mm. And, and, and that, is, that is why uh, the, the strict procedures uh, that Wayne has referred to um, are, are required. If the employee discloses information other than in accordance with the procedure that has been established, well then there's no protection. Calling the media, for instance. Calling the media. And th right. there's a case in the Labour Court, interestingly, where an employee simply blind copied an email uh, okay. to, to a number of senior managers right. uh, alleging some, some form of, uh, of, of wrongdoing in respect of particular transactions. Yes. And the Labour Court said, well, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not what the Act requires. The, the Act requires uh, oh. compliance with the procedure um, and I think, as, as Wayne has indicated, it highlights the importance um, of, uh, of, uh, of, of procedures in the workplace and the need for companies yes. uh, to, to establish those procedures. Okay. So, the employee makes a disclosure, a protected disclosure. Um, how does the company then deal with that afterwards? I mean, what, what actually happens? Because uh, there, there's bound to be some conflict coming out of these things, I would imagine. So, I mean, absolutely. And I, uh, the, the, I think the real, the real test is not so much about the actual disclosure. I think the real test comes in, 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 into how you then align that with, with how you deal with those issues. Yes. Uh, in, in terms of having the proper disciplinary pro processes in place. Uh, having having the the processes that are going to uh, to have the corrective outcomes. Yes. Uh, if you, if you don't have that in place and you simply have the disclosure, uh, I think you you're not going to get anywhere with it. Then. It's pretty pointless. Yeah. The other just the other yes. point on the on the conflict issue is uh, what a lot of companies are going the route of saying, well, if if employees believe that the company is too close to the issue, uh, there are service providers who actually say you know, with anonymity guaranteed, uh, you. You, you report this to us and, and, and employers then contract into that. So something like an anti-corruption hotline. Yes. Uh, in terms of an employee who is making a protected disclosure, I mean, what, what, pr what protection would they have? Well, the statute provides protection against what are called occupational detriments. Uh, that, that includes dismissal. It obviously includes disciplinary measures short of dismissal, such as a demotion or a suspension or any form of warning. Um, it would also prevent an employer from perhaps transferring an employee against his or her will or discriminating against that employee. Basically any change in the conditions of em or the terms of employment? Uh, in essence, uh, in, any prejudice to the employee uh, in, in broad terms uh, is an occupational detriment. And uh, interestingly, if, if, you look at the, if you look at the decisions in the courts, what, what a number of employees do uh, is, is to bring applications in the Labour Court as a matter of urgency uh, to interdict disciplinary proceedings. Now, is that the procedure? You, do you go through conciliation first and then it would, would hit the Labour Court? No, no. I, the, there's the, the, the rules of the Labour Court provide that um, uh, parties, might, uh, parties may bring urgent applications and, right. and, and typically what happens is that the employer convenes a disciplinary inquiry. The employee alleges that uh, the discipline is, is, a, is an occupational detriment. In other words, a reprisal for having made a for having made a disclosure. Okay. Uh, the employee then seeks to interdict the employer from uh, continuing with that inquiry. And um, there have been a number of cases uh, of, of, of that sort. Okay. The, the, the other point to remember is that uh, if an employer dismisses an employee yes. for having made a protected disclosure, the dismissal is automatically unfair. Right. That, that, that means that uh, the enhanced compensation uh, for which the Labor Relations Act provides uh, 24 months uh, remuneration as opposed to the ordinary measure of 12 months. Which would uh, be the case in a normal yes, unfair dismissal. Is, is, well, the, 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 the 24 months compensation formula is available to an employee uh, who has been dismissed for uh, having made, uh, who has been dismissed uh, in, in, in contravention of the okay. Act. Right, thank you, thank you both. And to you at home, we'll see you again next week. Good night. Law at Work is sponsored by Perrett van Niekerk, Woodhouse Machulo, leading labour law specialists representing businesses throughout South and Southern Africa, as well as Case Law, the quick, fast and easy labour law search engine.